What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host, and my name is John, and we are back with episode 60, where we will be analyzing and predicting the UFC 237 pay-per-view going down this Saturday night in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, headlined by Rose Nama Yunus versus Jessica Andrade for the Women's Strawweight Championship. It is a hell of a pay-per-view. I can't wait to break down all 13 fights. And at the end of the podcast, we'll be qu- quickly recapping the UFC Ottawa card, like always. But uh, starting things off, we have 13 matchups that are, you know, very good fights. You know, we have a lot of legends on the card, a lot of very well-known names like BJ Penn, uh, Lil Nog, Diago Alves. Uh, Jose Aldo, Anderson Silva, you know, so we, Aldo and Silva, those are two of the top five fighters in the history of mixed martial arts, and they're fighting on the same card back to back, so it's going to be a real pleasure, this should be a hell of a pay-per-view, and it starts at 6.30 p.m., the prelims kick off, and the main card will start at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, we have 13 fights, and starting things off in the women's bantamweight division, we have Talita Bernardo, who is five and three, taking on Vivian Arujo, who is six and one. There is currently no betting line uh, for this fight, unfortunately, because it is a short notice fight that uh, that just came about. Uh, I honestly just realized that, but I did tape the fight, so I'll give you my thoughts on the fight without the perspective of the odds. Talita Bernardo was supposed to face Melissa Gatto, and she was a minus five hundred favorite in that fight. Um, but now this uh, uh, Vivian uh, Arujo is t- coming in on short notice. Now, her last name looks like Arajo, um, but it's Brazilian, and the announcers were calling her Arujo in her fights over in Pancras. So uh, Arujo is moving up from 115 pounds to 135 pounds in this one. So it's going to be a tough fight. Just based on that fact alone, she's going to be giving up 20 pounds to Talita Bernardo, who should be the better grappler by a good margin. She has really good top pressure. You know, she uh, kept Sarah Moras on her back the entire time. A girl who's pretty good at attacking off her back, but you know, Bernardo was able to uh, was hold hold her down. Uh, was able to take her down pretty easily with some some nice outside trips. And uh, you know, she did get taken down her uh, by Moras herself in round three, but she she hit a really really nice deep half sweep to reverse that position. Um, you know, she she's, she had a vast array of takedowns in that fight, and Bernardo's striking has actually been a lot improved ever since she got outstruck uh, versus uh, Irene Aldana, who's also fighting on this card. But Bernardo, you know, her striking looked a lot better in that fight with Maras, uh, and, uh, you know, Arahu looks, or Arujo looks legit, you know, she um, has very g- legit striking of her own, she's got good output, she would, you know, beat some girls up really, really bad in her most recent fights. You know, both both of those fights, I think uh, her opponents had, like, basically the fight was stopped because she beat her opponent's face so badly that their eyes were swollen, and they had to stop the fights um, over in uh, over in Pancrase, um, you know, so and they were, you know, decent, decent fighters of their own right. They had, you know, winning records, they had a little bit of experience, but they didn't look, to, you know, too high level by any means. Uh, her one loss is coming to UFC fighter uh, Sarah Frota. Um, so, you know, it's just going to be a tough task for Arujo to co- up, go up and wait and to beat Bernardo in this one. Uh, it seems like Arujo has a decent ground game, but it's not, it's not going to be anywhere near uh, good enough to compete with the black belt Bernardo, who should have, a, you know, 15 pounds at least on Arujo in this fight. So it's honestly kind of crazy that they're sanctioning this fight. Arujo coming in on maybe four or five days notice and moving up 20 pounds. So... Uh, you know, uh, hopefully uh, uh, Bernardo wins this one. It should be a pretty clear decision. And the line, when it opens, she should be a, probably another minus four or 500 favorite in this one. So moving on to the next fight in the Bantamweight division, we have Hayoni Barcelos, who is 13-1, taking on Carlos Quiros, who is 10-3-2. The opening betting line for this one was Barcelos, the minus 320 favorite to Quiros as the plus 240 underdog. Right now, we are seeing over on our affiliated sportsbook Five Dimes, Barcelos is minus 1100 to Quiros at plus 700. So even though Barcelos opened as uh, an implied probability of um, 76.1%, now he stands at probability of 91.6%. So. 
you know, a huge, huge shift in the odds for Barcelos. Honestly, I don't really agree with it. I think where the opening line um, came out at was pretty accurate. You know, Quiros looks, you know, he's making his UFC debut in this one uh, against a, a guy who's proven in the UFC, Barcelos. But Quiros looks very legit. You know, he's got a powerful inside leg kick. He's got, you know, good boxing. He's got power in his hands. He, he likes to brawl, man. He likes to get in reckless exchanges and, you know, throw hands. And that is what you've seen in a lot of his regional fights. Uh, but he has gone the 15, uh, full 15 minutes. He won a fight. Um, you know, uh, I forget the, against the gentleman's name. I, I think he actually did have a losing record. So uh, it wasn't that impressive of a victory. Uh, let's see who he went the distance against. Um, Rodrigo Vera, actually, no, no, he was 6-0, and apparently, but that guy wasn't very good, honestly. Uh, his most recent two knockout wins over, are over lower-level guys with a 4-7 and record and a 10-8 and record. So, you know, you can't take those wins, you know, um, too seriously. But, you know, I've been impressed with Quiroz. You know, he looks game. He looks like he's going to come in here and throw down with uh, Heone Barcelos, which I think would be his best pass to victory. You know, Barcelos is a very, very legit fighter. And uh, Quiros, you know, he's a veteran. You know, he uh, he got caught in a knee bar in one of his fights, and he he pulled the Brazilian tap, where he tapped once, and his opponent let the knee bar go. He looked at the referee. His opponent looked at the referee, and then he he got out of the knee bar. It was a you know a really hilarious moment. I recommend you go check that out. It was against. Um, I believe Bruno Pereira was the gentleman's name. A uh, hilarious, hilarious moment. Um, so, uh, and we're getting over to Barcelos in this one. He's a you know a former uh, featherweight. He moved down a bantamweight, and he looked really, really good in his last fight against uh, Chris Gutierrez. You know he uh, he started a bit slow against Gutierrez, but he was in control of the fight the entire time. Uh, you know, Barcelos has got great boxing. He's got power in both hands. You know, he rocked Hollowbalk with a, a left hand, and then he finished him with a, a right hand. A vicious combination that knocked Kurt Hollowbalk out. Who was that fight was at featherweight too? You know, so he was knocking dudes out of featherweight, and he moved down to. Uh, uh, Bantamweight, and he finished Gutierrez via rear naked choke in the last fight. You know, he he was smashing Gutierrez with ground and pound really hard in that fight, and Gutierrez gave up his back, and he got the choke. So Barcelos is a very well-rounded fighter, but what I think is going to happen in this fight is I think they're going to stand in, in the center of the octagon and trade, honestly. I think that that's what I've seen in most of Quiros' fights, and, you know, Barcelos is definitely game to uh, swing and bang from time to time as well. So if Barcelos wants to fight smart, I would I would recommend that he you know uses his grappling. I still think he could get a finish in the second or third round if he you know uses that grappling, goes to that ground and pound and looks to open up a submission or a TKO. But if he stands and trades, you know that's where he's actually going to be in a, a, a vulnerable spot in this one. I think Quiros has a good chance at you know catching that chin of Barcelos if they get engaged in a firefight early. So in terms of a plus seven hundred underdog, man, there's value all over that. If I'm being real. You know, Barcelos should win this fight. He should be minus three or four hundred, but nowhere near minus eleven hundred. I cannot believe the amount of juice that is coming in on Barcelos. Um, you know, so I, I'm going to pick Barcelos to get the W, but I think that Quiros is definitely a, a good value bet, a good value stab on uh, you know his TKO line at you know plus eleven or twelve hundred or something like that. Yeah, plus eleven fifty. It's been that since it opened. You know. I, Plus 11.50 for for a guy maybe going to test Barcelos' chin in a firefight. That's a price I'm willing to pay. So the pick is going to be Barcelos. Moving on to the next fight in the welterweight division, we have Warley Alves, who is 12 and 3, taking on Sergio Marais, who is 14, 4 and 1. The opening betting line for this one was Alves, the minus 160 favorite to Marais at plus 140. Right now, over on five dimes, line margins have tightened up. We see Alves minus 130 to Marais, or Marais at plus 110. So, uh, you know, very close fight in this one. I think the odds indicate it to, um, you know, Brazilian guys who I think for their most, the most part in their career have been, you know, underachievers. I think that neither of these guys really... Uh, excel in one part of uh, of fighting honestly you know Marais is a former world champion black belt in jiu-jitsu um, but you know in terms of implementing his jiu-jitsu in in mma and in the ufc i don't think he's had much success at all i think his his wrestling is not very good his take you know he doesn't set up takedowns well 
Um, you know, he he has picked up a couple submissions in the UFC, the most recent one being over Ben Saunders, who is, you know, a very legitimate grappler in his own right. But that was, you know, that was a very strategic fight. That was eight or nine minutes of guard passing, and it was, a, you know, contested pretty much all on the ground. It was pretty much a, a jiu-jitsu match in that one, honestly. I think b- very barely any punches were thrown in that one. And then in Marais' most recent fight against Anthony Rocco Martin, he looked terrible. You know, his striking has always been terrible. He was knocked out by Usman. He was outstruck by Tim Means and was gifted a decision in that one. He just looked very bad against um, Rocco Martin. You know, Marais, I think his best win is probably over uh, Davi Hamos. uh, You know, picking up a decision win over uh, another very talented black belt uh, in in, in Hamos. But... um, you know, Marais, I don't think, you know, he doesn't have good defense. He, he wings strikes, and, uh, you know, he, he likes pulling guard a lot. Um, but the thing is about his jiu-jitsu, too, is he's very good on top, you know. But on, in terms of being on his back, he doesn't really have much, honestly. You know, Anthony Rocco Martin put him on his back, and, you know, Marais didn't really have an answer. He kind of was just content to lay on his back for the rest of the round. Um, but, you know, Warley Alves, again, another guy who, who is not really good anywhere. Uh, I'd say he had, his striking is his best, um, you know, his best attribute. He, he's decent in the clinch, but, you know, he looked real, real bad in his last fight against James Krause. You know, not only car- cardio-wise he looked bad, uh, you know, just mental. You know, he just didn't look like he wanted to be in there. He looked like he was broken in there. It looked like after the first round... Kraus could sense it that you know this guy really didn't have much for me and then Kraus went out there and finished him uh, rocked him with the knee and finished him off with some uh, some extra punches to get the finish in that one so you know this is a tough fight to pick because just neither guy has looked any good lately um, you know I think that uh, Warley Alves's gas tank is pretty bad he tends to gas out in a lot of his fights um, he was, you know, he was, again, just like Marias, he was outstruck clean by Kamaru Usman, a guy who's not really known for his striking and more of a, a pressure fighter and a grappler. Um, you know, Wally Alva, both these guys are very tough. They can both take a beating and they both, you know, still don't give up and they both still co- keep coming forward. But, you know, I think I would give the slight edge to Marias in this one just because how bad Al- I think Alves looked even worse than Marias in his last fight, much worse, you know, getting knocked out by Kraus. Um, and it, instead of losing a decision to Rocco Martin. So I think Marais will be the more aggressive one on the feet. I think he will be, you know, willing to press the action a little more. I think that, uh, you know, this fight will has a good chance of ending up a lot in the clinch, you know, being a grinding type of fight. And I think that Marais will probably, you know, maybe get a takedown or two and just lay on top, uh, you know, win a couple rounds and maybe win a decision 29-28. But I'm expecting a really, really bad fight from this one. Um, I just think that their styles aren't gonna aren't gonna you know coincide well. I think we're gonna be in for a, you know a boring stalling type of fight. Both these guys are Brazilians. You know they've been around for a while. They probably you know know each other, have respect for one another, and are just gonna come out here and have a you know a lights bar match. But I hope I'm wrong. But I'm gonna side with Marias to get a decision uh, two rounds to one. The next fight takes place in the women's flyweight division. We have Priscilla Cachoeira, who is eight and two, taking on Luana Carolina, who is five and one. The opening betting line for this one was Carolina as the plus two fifty underdog to Cachoeira at minus three hundred. Um, very confusing line here, and it has since flipped. We are now seeing Carolina minus one seventy five to Cachoeira at plus one fifty five. So. You know, absolutely massive line movement coming in here. Not only did the line flip, but it went from being, Carolina went from being a big underdog to, you know, a pretty moderate favorite. So, don't know what the odds maker was thinking there. You know, Cachoeira looked pretty bad in her last fight against Molly McCann. She was, you know, just winging punches that whole fight. You know, she looks very stiff on the feet. She doesn't really move her head. Her chin is, you know on the center line the entire time just eats eats punches you know she's tough as fuck you know we saw that against uh Shevchenko and she actually uh, took a lot of punishment versus McCann and actually came back and won round three versus Molly McCann she was definitely coming on strong and you know landing the harder shots and more more punches too her output looked good in round three and she definitely stole round three versus McCann so she never gives up and she's you know uh, she'll keep coming forward but man it's going to be tough for her to win this fight because Carolina will be, uh, I believe, the taller and longer girl. She'll have the better striking. Uh, Carolina's definitely got a, mu- uh, a Muay Thai style. She likes head kicks, 
Um, she has good clinch, um, good knees and elbows as well against the cage. She, you know, finished her uh, one of her opponents with some nasty knees and elbows against the cage, knocked her out cold. Um, you know, she, and uh, she doesn't accept a uh, bottom position either. You know, I don't think that. Uh, the, the takedowns will come into this fight at all. It's almost not even worth mentioning. I've never seen Cachoeira grapple. Um, but, you know, her opponent, uh, Carolina's opponent, Lima, on the Tuesday Night Contender Series, tried try taking her down that entire fight. And, you know, Carolina's takedown defense stood tall. She was reversing takedowns, you know, digging underhooks. She was, and, and when she did get taken down, she was trying to get back up to her feet. She was not really complacent to play off her back too much in that fight. So, like I said, I don't think that'll come into play in this one. I think it'll be a complete kickboxing match. And I think that Carolina will probably win this one two rounds to one. I think she's, you know, the more polished strike. Her. She has better defense. You know, Cachoeira is a zombie, though, so she'll keep marching forward. That's why I gave, will uh, predict that Cachoeira wins one round because uh, I could see it going like the Mon McCann fight where McCann just, uh, or Carolina uh, outstrikes Cachoeira for the first round or two, and Cachoeira just keeps coming forward and is more active in round three but still loses the fight. So um, the pick is going to be Carolina to get this one done, and congrats to anybody who uh, jumped in on her as an underdog. But in terms of of betting her at a favorite right now i would not do that i would not this is a complete pass fight for me there's no value on cachoeira and i could never bet uh, a debuting um a debuting women's fighter to keep the fight standing all, all, all fight you know it's not nothing against carolina i'm I, I like i said i'm picking her to win this fight and i think she'll uh, she'll look good out there but when uh when you're talking women's MMA and you you're relying on the the fight to keep standing, you gotta be weary. You know it's you know you there are very few women who can keep the fight standing the entire time who can implement a striking game plan and keep the fight standing. Even though Cachoeira's like I said, Cachoeira's takedown is is non-existent pretty much. Uh, I would just not trust Carolina as a favorite making her debut, relying on her outstriking Cachoeira in this one. So the pick is gonna be Cachoeira, excuse me, Carolina. Next fight is taking place in the lightweight division. We have Clay Guida, who is 34 and 18, taking on BJ Penn, who is 16, 13, and 2. The opening betting line for this one was Guida, the minus 400 favorite to Penn at plus 330. Over on five dimes right now, Guida is sitting at minus 700 to BJ Penn at plus 500. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention. BJ Penn, man, has not won a fight since 2010. That is nine years ago. And I believe it was against Matt Hughes, too, who, who yeah, it was, who, you know, was a quick knockout, who Matt Hughes was already past his prime, way past his prime at that point in his career. You know, if we're going back to the Frankie Edgar fights, you know, um, BJ Penn has lost, uh, let's see, eight of his last nine fights, you know, one of those fights being a draw. So, you know, it's really sad that this guy is still fighting. He's looked terrible in the cage lately. He got his knee torn up versus Ryan Hall. You know, he didn't look that bad against Dennis Seaver. I will give him that. Back in June of 2017, he he definitely won a round versus Dennis Seaver. He looked decent in that fight uh, up until round three, honestly. You know, he looked, uh, you know, he was, he looked, like I said, decent. Uh, he dropped uh, Dennis Seaver with a nice uh, uppercut punch in round two of that fight, but besides that, he he looked you know he looked definitely old. He looked slow. He he was getting beat up really really bad in round three. Almost got finished in round three. Um, so you know B J Penn, you know it's really sad that this guy's still fighting. Uh, you know a lot of issues in his personal life have come up le lately, and uh, I won't go into them too much except for the fact that. What his wife said is the the reason why BJ Penn is still fighting is because he uses training camps as an excuse to stay stay sober. You know he is you know such an alcoholic and uh, um, I think alcohol is his main abuse problem. But he you know also has had problems with other drugs that I've heard that he you know he can't stop drinking unless he has a fight lined up where he, so he has that camp where he can you know say you know have that motivation and not drink for a while. So that's pretty sad, you know, and if, you know, that he, he's using it as a crutch for his addiction, you know, you obviously can't really think that this fight's going to go too well for BJ Penn, and he's fighting Clay Guida, who's, you know, still the much, much fresher fighter. He did drop his last fight uh, to via submission to Charles Oliveira, and he looked, he looked kind of, uh, it wasn't too good of a performance from him, you know. 
Oliveira threw a barrage of punches and Guida shelled up. You know, uh, he put up a high guard. None of the punches really landed from Oliveira. But, you know, the pressure from Oliveira was enough for Guida to go for a takedown. He shot a takedown, uh, you know, sort of out of desperation and, you know, got his neck uh, snatched and got guillotined in that fight, you know, just two minutes into the fight. And, you know, everybody knows about Oliveira is he has a wicked guillotine, a wicked ground game, you know, and, you know, Guido, you know, showed a low fight IQ moment in that fight when he went for that takedown, leaving his neck exposed. But fight before that, he knocked out Joe Lozon, looked real good in that fight, showed some power in his hands, showed some improved boxing in that one. And, of course, everybody knows about Clay Guida. Uh, relentless pressure, you know, he's constantly going for takedowns, you know, leg kicks, you know. He's been, you know, pretty much the same fighter for the past decade, you know, just been pressuring you, looking looking for takedowns, pushing you against the cage, you know, and now I think his boxing has looked better in his, you know, most recent fights too, so, you know, anywhere where this fight ends up, I think that Guida will be in control, I think that he could take Penn down, and Penn won't really be a threat uh, on the ground, even though he does have that jiu-jitsu black belt, um, you know, on the feet, I think it will be a blowout for Clay Guida. I, th- I can honestly see Guida stopping uh, BJ Penn in this fight. And I do think that he stops him in probably round three of this fight. Just seeing how badly Dennis Seaver was beating up BJ Penn in round three of their fight, you know, leads me to believe that Clay Guida will get the finish here. So um, it's sad that BJ is still fighting. You know, it's, it's pretty despicable the UFC is still booking him. And I'm picking Clay Guida to win this fight decisively by a third round knockout. The next fight takes place in the women's bantamweight division. We have Irene Aldana, who is nine and four, taking on Betch Kohea, who is ten three and one. The opening betting line for this one was Aldana, the minus one seventy five favorite, to Kohea at plus one fifty. Right now, over on five dimes, we are seeing Aldana minus three fifty to Kohea plus two ninety. So a lot more action coming in on Irene Aldana's way. And rightfully so, you know, this is a very good matchup for Aldana in this one. Aldana coming off that great performance in her last fight against Lucy Put- Lucy Putlova. You know, one of the best women's fights of all time where, you know, two women just were, you know, punching each other, coming forward the entire time. You know, both of them had, you know, good kicks in that fight, leg kicks, head kicks. It was just nonstop pressure back and forth, uh, mostly a boxing match for the most part between those two. And Aldana definitely got the better of it. You know, she has real long punches, a good stiff jab, good output in cardio. You know, she was throwing hard up until the last bell of that fight. She also got le- good leg kicks too. You know, she'd go inside and she'd go outside with those leg kicks. She's definitely boxing oriented, so, you know, she's got good defense. She's got good head movement. And honestly, I was impressed with her her strength in the clinch versus Pudilova. Um, she she was able to uh, you know stuff some takedowns by Bernardo when they fought. You know she beat Talita Bernardo pretty ha- uh, handedly in that fight. Was out striking her on the feet and was you know staying safe from the takedowns of Bernardo. So you know I'm really impressed with Irene Aldana. You know she has lost fights in the UFC before. You know uh, I believe to Caitlin Chukagian was one of her losses, um, yeah, she lost that by split decision, Leslie Smith, she lost that fight, but, uh, you know, her, her most recent fights, I've seen some real improvements from Aldana, I think, uh, you know, the boxing will just be a, a nightmare for Betch Cohea in this one, you know, Betch Cohea has not fought in, uh, almost two years, I believe, uh, July of 2017 was her last fight, let's check this shit out, it was against, um, Holly Holm, yeah, June of 2017, so two-year layoff for Kohea coming in this one, and, you know, she looked terrible in that fight, you know, she, she, uh, you know, has lost uh, three of her most recent five fights, you know, one of those fights being a a draw, a questionable one at that to Marion Renault, Um, you know, she's getting up there in age, 35 years old is Kohea now, and she was never really that good, you know, ever in her career. You know, she picked up a couple wins and did get that title shot versus Rousey. But that was at the lowest level that the Bantamweight division ever was at. Besh Kohea versus Ronda Rousey, man. What a what a terrible fight that was. Just an absolute... Like, you can, you can go out to, you know, the streets of Philadelphia and see two girls scrapping on the corner uh, and see a better fight than Besh Kohea versus... Um, Ronda Rousey in that one so you know and let's get back to the home fight because that's what we have to go off of her most recent fight she just looks so tentative in that fight you know she she's got 
barely any striking skill. You know, she she's primarily a striker for sure, but her her technique and her skill on the feet is just really low. Um, you know, she's very emotional too. She she wears her emotions right on her sleeve. You know, she, you know she was getting upset with uh, Holly Holm. You know, urging her on. Uh, telling her to come forward in round three of their fight, and ten seconds later was head kick knocked out, just sent into another dimension by Holly Holm back in 2017. So, you, you know, she, there's just you really can't expect Kohea from much. You know, she does have she does have decent grappling skills. She can you know hit a takedown from time to time. She can't really stay on top though. You know, and I I was definitely impressed with Aldana's takedown defense against. Bernardo enough who's a black belt with you know some really good grappling and you know Aldana did end up on bottom I think once or twice in that fight but for the most part you know she she got the better of the grappling exchanges she stuffed the takedowns and she won that fight clearly so if Kohea tries to you know make this uh go for the takedown I think that Aldana will stuff it and I think that Aldana just outboxes the shit out of Kohea for this entire fight you know I honestly see Aldana stopping Kohea I think Kohea you know two-year layoff, you know, c coming in at 35, you know, being that emotional type of fighter, I think that, uh, you know, Aldana, she's going to get really frustrated by with Aldana's jab, she's going to be walking into punches, and after, you know, 8, 12 minutes of this fight, I can see Kohea, you know, giving up, getting caught against the cage, and Aldana just teeing off of the barrage full of punches. Now, Aldana does not throw, you know, too hard with any single strike, but, you know, when she's out accumulating 150, 200 punches, man, she does serious damage. You know, you saw Pudilova's face at the end of uh, their fight, you know, same thing with Bernardo. She butchered Bernardo up with her boxing. So, you know, I could be a little biased with Aldana in this one just because I was so impressed and entertained by her her last fight. But uh, And I'm just so unimpressed with Kohea. And I can't even believe Kohea is coming back to the UFC uh, in this one. So I, I pick an Aldana to get a third round TKO in this one. The next fight is taking place in the lightweight division. We have Thiago Moises, who is 11-3, taking on Kurt Hollebach, who is 17-6. The opening betting line for this one was Thiago Moises, the minus 150 favorite to Hollebach at plus 125. Right now, over on five dimes, we are seeing line margins tightened up at Moises, minus 125 to Hollebach, plus 105. So, Kurt Hollebach moving up to lightweight in this fight. You know, his most uh, recent fights in the UFC have been at featherweight, although he has fought at lightweight throughout his career um, back in Titan FC. He actually picked up, you know, some decent wins at, at lightweight over, you know, UFC guys um, like uh, Desmond Green, Yodenis Cedeno, and uh, Jesus Calcante. Um, you know, has gone the, has gone the five round distance before. You know, so uh, Kurt Hollebach, um, unfortunately, he hasn't had much success in the UFC so far. He he knocked out Matt Bassette on the Tuesday Night Contender Series. I'm pretty sure he tested positive for like weed uh, in the Tuesday Night Contender Series, and then his UFC debut was delayed a year. He went in there against Hayoni Barcelos and was you know outstruck for the majority of that fight, and eventually knocked out pretty brutally in round three of that fight. And then that was against Barcelos, the guy who was fighting on this card as well at Bantamweight, you know. So he was knocked out by a Bantamweight, and now uh, a current Bantamweight, and now he's fighting at, at Lightweight. So that's going to be something interesting in this fight. And in Hollabach's most recent fight against Burgos, he, he uh, rocked Burgos with some punches early in that fight, uh, dropped him with a combination, and but then went in went in uh, overzealous to try to finish Shane Burgos. You know, sat in Burgos' guard for a second, and Burgos threw up a nasty armbar and tapped Hollebach out with that. So you know, pretty uh, pretty low IQ moment from uh, Hollebach in that fight. However, uh, Moises had a, a good a share of uh, low IQ moments in his last fight as well. Moises came in making his UFC debut against Benil Daryush. Uh, at elevation uh, in Denver and you know just looked horrible in that fight you know he jumped guillotine three times in that fight all three times Daryush was able to escape you know one or two of them might have been um, you know a little bit tight you know you know he is a world-class jiu-jitsu black belt so I can't completely you know uh, dismiss his judgment in that one you know if he saw the opportunity for the guillotine you know that's why he went for it but Usually, when you jump guillotine, it's not really a good move. You know, you I'd say 19 out of 20 people who jump guillotine in the UFC end up not getting that guillotine, end up on their backs, 
and you know in guard. So it's uh you know he he just didn't have an answer for Darius. Darius just out grappled him in that fight. Was taking him down. You know grinding him against the cage. You know Moises was able to get up uh, a couple of times, but you know Darius dragged him back down. Darius took his back a couple of times. He did defend the runic and choke two times in that fight, but. You know, Moises was just outclassed from bell to bell in that one by Daryush. But, you know, expectedly, I think I honestly was picking Moises going into that fight. But, man, Daryush surprised the shit out of me in that fight. So, uh, you know, on Moises' Tuesday Night Contender Series, man, his striking looked good. He uh, he fought uh, a gentleman by the name of Glidison Kutis and, you know, knocked him out in round one of that fight. You know, had some some knockouts in in RFA and LFA earlier in his career. Over you know solid competition, he's be- beaten uh, Zach Freeman, Jamal Emers. You know, bo- all these guys have good records, um, in the, in the legitimate promotion of uh, RFA and LFA too. Uh, has fought fought the full five round distance before. Um, you know, I think he was a title a title holder in those promotions. And, uh, you know, he dropped uh, Kudis with a, a right hand, and, and I think he finished him with a head kick as well, uh, and Kudis in that fight, you know. So his striking looks real good in that fight. So uh, getting down to this matchup, uh, how these two are going to, you know, play out with one another. If it, if it's contested on the feet, I expect it to be really close. I think that uh, Hollowbach has the better boxing. I think he cuts off the cage very well. And I think that uh, if he comes out here, you know, throwing heavy like he always does, he could present some problems for Moises, but uh, I think Moises, you know, has the more, uh, you know, diverse offense. I think he has the, uh, you know, the better kicking game of the two. I think he has good boxing as well. That's why I'm expecting it to be real close in the feet, but uh, in terms of the size advantage, you know, Moises being the, the natural lightweight Hollabach moving up to lightweight in this one, I, I think Moises will have a little bit of size on him, and I think that that will, you know, uh, lean um, Moises to to try to grapple in this fight. You know he should have the the, the grappling advantage in this one. We have not really seen too much uh, takedown defense from Kurt Hallbach. You know he uh, he was able to defend takedowns against Cavacante in their uh, their early fights. Um, but uh, you know he was not checking leg kicks in that fight against uh, Calvicante. He uh, he did eventually get taken down uh, one time in round three of that fight, so he didn't completely prevent the takedown in that one. So I think Moises could definitely get him down with this one. I think Moises could be attacking the leg kicks on the feet and looking to uh, you know uh, inhibit. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word uh, to prevent uh, Kurt Hollebach from. Uh, you know, getting his striking going early in this fight, and then Moises can look to take that to take this fight to the floor once he, you know, uh, chops that lead leg of Hollabach. So, I'm gonna give the slight lean to Moises. You know, he is the Brazilian taking on the American in Brazil in this one. You know, you'd be fooling yourself if you didn't think that Brazilian judges have an influence. They do. The crowd definitely has an influence. Um, you know, the, every, this fight is pretty deep on the card. That place should, the, the, the arena should be filled up with, you know, 15,000 Brazilians at that point going crazy for every move, move Moises does. So if this one comes down to being a close decision, I give the, the edge to Moises. And just overall, I think he has the more pass to victory to win this one. So I'm going to slightly side with Moises, but it's not a confident pick at all. The next fight is taking place in the light heavyweight division. We have Antonio Hogirio Noguera, aka Lil Nog, who is 23 and 8, taking on Ryan Spann, who is 15 and 5. The opening betting line for this one was Ryan Spann as the minus 190 favorite to Lil Nog at plus 165. Right now, over on five dimes, we are seeing line margins tightened up. Span at minus 145 to Noguera at plus 125. Now, I don't usually use fighters' nicknames, but honestly, I barely know the guy as Antonio Hogirio Noguera. You know, it's just Lil Nog. It's just Big Nog to everybody, and I'm sure, um, you know, the Brazilians can't wait to see the legend Lil Nog fight in Brazil uh, again. You know, he had great success in his last fight in Brazil, you know, against Sam Alvey. Knocked Sam Alvey out in round two of that fight, picking up... Uh, you know, his his first win in years coming off of, uh, you know, tough loss against Bader, coming off that USADA suspension for the tainted supplements, uh, quote-unquote tainted supplements. 
But in that fight against Noguera, although he did, or excuse, against Alvi, Noguera did not look, you know, too good. He definitely looked a little slow. He definitely uh, was, you know, low output in that first round. He's pretty much primarily a boxer at this point, you know. He was never really as solid of a grappler as his brother, Big Nog. And, you know, he has lost fights via, actually his most recent loss, you know, Ryan Bader was taking him down and was, was uh, pounding him out uh, on the ground and eventually finished him with some ground to pound in round three of that fight. Um, so, you know, you got to think that uh, the span is going to look to do the same thing, honestly. I think that on the feet, Noguera should have the edge in this one. I think he's, you know, even though he's old and he's slow, he still has got some power in his hands. But, you know, I think Sam Alvey hit him with a couple punches in that fight. And, I, you know, Noguera did not react too well to them, you know. It was his first fight in two and a half years, I'll give him that. So, you know, could have just been a little ring rust. He didn't, you know, wasn't used to getting, you know, punched in the face for, for a little while. But, you know, Alvi hit him with a couple punches. And, you know, Noguera, you know, moved backwards. He definitely looked like the punches bothered him a little bit. So, you know, he's taking on Ryan Spann in this one, who is, you know, fairly new to the UFC. I think he's only had one fight in the UFC, if I'm correct. Um you know, and it's it's hard to identify, you know, what his specialty is at this point. Yeah, one win was over Luis Henrique, you know, it was a, a pretty dominant performance um, by Hen uh, Henrique in that fight. So uh, against, uh, you know, in, in Span, you know, it's just, he doesn't really have one area where he thrives, honestly. He does, uh, four of his last five wins are by uh, rear naked, or excuse me, by um, first round finish. Uh, I'd say his guillotine is really his best his best weapon. He does have solid striking. He can hit a takedown. He can you know stay on top position. He can do everything you know fairly well. But it's just he doesn't really uh, stick out in one area of the game as being you know a striker or a grappler. But you know he's just a, a big huge athletic dude. This dude's six five. You know he's gonna you know even even with big old uh, Nog in there, he's gonna have some size on Noguera in this one. Um, you know, he uh, he was able to stuff a lot of the takedown attempts of uh, Luis Henrique. Um, so I don't I don't think that Noguera will have this you know the the wrestling, the speed, the anything to get Span on his back in this one. I think if this fight ends up on the floor, it'll actually be Span initiating the takedowns, and I think that that's probably his best path to victory. You know, he he should uh he should be able to get top position and keep top position and uh you know win that fight via you know ground and pound or win it via decision if he, he if he stays in the feet you know he's going to be playing with fire you know Noguera still got power he still got great technique in his boxing and he could certainly catch span with a punch on the feet uh, but, you know, Span is, you know, tough as nails. And this fight with Alex Nicholson, he was getting, you know, whooped in that fight. He was get, he was almost unconscious. He was getting lit up with ground and pound. And right when Alex Nicholson started to gas out, you know, uh, Span got back up to his feet and knocked Nicholson out with some punches uh, 10 seconds after he was on the ground, you know. So there's, there's no quitting this guy. He's not going to go down easy. Even when Noguera finished uh, Sam Alvey, you know, he rocked Alvey with a punch and he got so wild and uncoordinated after he did that. Like, he got so excited that he rocked someone with a punch for the first time in years and was just swarming Alvey with no technique, no footwork, was just throwing spamming shots, leaving his chin up in the air. I can see him, you know, spent uh, Noguera hurting Span with a punch and then Span just you know countering while uh, Noguera is getting reckless and not paying attention to his defense and you know putting Noguera out in this one so uh no Noguera did pick up a nice win uh, as a big underdog uh versus Alvi in his last fight he is fighting in his home uh home country of Brazil uh, and you know he does have a path to victory in that one in this fight and that is you know winning with his boxing but I just think that Span is going to be the bigger, the more athletic guy. He's going to, you know, have more tools to win this fight, more pass to victory. I think he could win it on the feet or he could take this fight to the floor and win it with his uh, takedowns and ground and pound. So I'm going to side with Ryan Span. Uh, I think uh, where the odds are at now, there's not really too much value on Noguera. Maybe look for a live betting spot. Uh, in this one for either guy but you know if you got in on Noguera plus 165 that might have been a good line but um, you know where it sits at now I really don't think there's too much value 
uh, I would actually kind of side with the value on span at minus 145. But there's always the possibility uh, of the judges, you know, uh, pulling some pulling some shit with Nogueira. And it's I'm not really, you know, I'm not, you know, creating the stuff out of thin air. Thiago Alves, the guy in the next fight we're about to talk about, lost his last fight in Brazil, two rounds to one versus Max Griffin, but was given the decision. Uh, in that fight, you know, it, it was a pretty clear, you know, I think 75, 80% of people agree that Max Griffin won that fight two rounds to one, but somehow the, the judges gave that fight to, to Alves. So uh, it's not entire, it's not out of the realm of possibilities that uh, the judges could favor in this one, no Gara. So I would, I, I would pick spam, but I would definitely be more comfortable if he got a finish in this one. In the first fight on the pay-per-view card in the lightweight division, we have Francisco Trinaldo, who is 23-6, taking on Carlos Diego Ferreira, who is 15-2. The opening betting line for this one was Diego Ferreira as the minus-175 favorite to Trinaldo at plus-135. Right now, over on 5dimes.eu, we are seeing Diego Ferreira minus-170 to Trinaldo at plus 150 so the line has stayed the same there is definitely two-way action coming in on this fight the early action came in Trinaldo's way almost uh, the fight pretty much was at evens for a while and then now more money coming in on Diego Ferreira as we get closer to fight night I definitely think that the the action has come in the right way I think where the opening line was right Diego Ferreira should be uh, the favorite in this fight you know Trinaldo still throws with you know massive power you know you saw that against the evan dunham fight man he threw a knee to evan dunham's liver that looked like it could have killed a horse you know he he that knee was so perfectly timed and perfectly placed and you know a great stoppage from mark otter in that one because um evan dunham was wincing in pain on the ground there was no coming back from that knee Chinaldo, despite him getting up there in age, despite him being 41 now, I think he's still, you know, very athletic. He's still very muscular. He still has good takedown defense. You know, he he's so strong, man. He can dig that underhook and he can go for that wizard, you know, just so well. It's just his his build is good for stuff and takedowns. He's, you know, a shorter guy. He's his center of gravity is very low. The fight where he showed off his uh, takedown defense most recently was against Jim Miller. You know, Jim Miller is a, a great grappler who's actually been picking up wins left and right lately in the UFC. And Trinaldo was able to stuff Miller's takedowns in that fight very well. And he uh, was, you know, able to beat Miller, you know, more decisively than a lot of people have lately. You know, he can definitely scramble for takedowns as well. He can hit his own offensive takedowns. You know, he took down Jim Miller in that fight. Um... So, you know, Trinaldo is definitely does uh, still have his weaknesses. You know, he's, he tends to be uh, low output. He tends to throw, you know, single power shots. I think that, you know, his offense is a little bit predictable. He, he kind of relies on those one big punches, and he relies on rocking you with one big overhand. And he doesn't, you know, throw enough output. He doesn't set up his shots enough. And he doesn't, he, he does, he's not as, as effective with his striking as he could be. Now, he's taking on Diego Ferreira in this fight, who really impressed me in his last fight against Rustam Kabilov, man. He showed some of the best takedown defense and, you know, get-ups and re ability to reverse positions that I've ever seen. You know, Kabilov is a lifetime grappler, a lifetime Sambo fighter, has been on the mats since, you know, he was in the womb. And Diego Ferreira was able to stuff his takedowns not only stuff his takedowns but reverse the position and you know scramble uh you know out of the position and end up on top versus Kabilov, and which was just you know so so impressive to me in that fight Kabilov is a master at taking people down and winning boring decisions and, and but Ferrero was having none of that now Ferrero did face a little bit of trouble versus kyle nelson who is you know a natural featherweight uh in in his uh, second mo most recent fight he looked like he got rocked with a little bit of punches early in that fight, but I think it's mostly overstated. You know, what he was, you know, he did get caught with a few clean shots versus Nelson, but he didn't look really rocked. You know, he, he took down Nelson actually that same round, you know, a few seconds later. 
you know, it looked like he was hit with a couple hard punches and he leaned into like a head kick and it looked like he was he was rocked. But, you know, he took down Nelson. He he spent that entire round on top. He's got good top control and he's got really good ground and pound. So he, uh, you know, was able to finish uh, Kyle Nelson with ground and pound in round two of that fight. And uh, CDS striking has been, you know, improved as well. You know, he's adding a lot of different tools to his fight. He's got, a, you know, a real f nice front kick to the body. He's got solid boxing as well. So I think that if this fight stays on the feet, it, it will be close. You know, I think that Trinaldo still will have the power advantage. Uh, I think that, you know, trinaldo has got a, a decent kicking game as well. And, um, you know, it'll be really close on the feet. But I think that Ferreira's ground game will be the deciding factor here. I think that um, Trinaldo won't be able to take down Ferreira. I think that Ferreira will be the one, you know, ending up on top if this one goes to the ground. I think that Ferreira will be the one initiating the grappling exchanges. You know, Ferreira doesn't tend to set up his takedowns, you know, that well you know he's definitely struggled with setting him up in the past but you know with Trinaldo's style when he's swinging those big bombs and he has those short outbursts of offense you know those are tailor-made to you know Ferreira just to duck under and to you know go for that takedown once uh Trinaldo starts swinging wild so I think that Ferreira will get this fight to the ground I think that he will just mix up the striking and the ground game a little bit better and I think that Ferreira will win a close decision in this one but it, it's a very close fight and I honestly you know, even though I was so impressed with Ferrer in his last fight, uh, I was, I'm you know very high on the guy right now. I think he will win this fight at a price tag of minus 170. Man, I don't know if I can fully trust him. It's uh you know Trinaldo is just too dangerous to uh, to be be uh, betting against as a favorite at that price. I actually think that the value right now would be on Trinaldo at plus 150. So. The value uh, on, on the betting area is with Trinaldo, but in terms of who's going to win the fight, I think that Ferreira will win this one uh, two rounds to one on the scorecards. Now the next fight is taking place in the welterweight division. We got Tiago Alves, who is 23-3, taking on Laureano Steropoli, who is 8-1. The opening betting line for this one was... Alves, the minus 185 favorite to Staropoli at plus 145. Right now, over on five dimes, we are seeing uh, Alves minus 115 to Staropoli minus 105. So line margins have tightened up a lot more action coming in on Staropoli's way. I think that where the opening line was set was a bit too high. This is a very, very close fight. You know, I expect it to be contested uh, completely on the feet. I think that both of these guys, you know, their their, their game is uh, striking. You know, Alves' his entire career has been built around striking, and in Steropoli's, uh, you know, his regional footage, he, he looked terrible. You know, his striking looked really bad, and his grappling looked even worse. But then in uh, Steropoli's debut in his home country of Argentina uh, versus Hector Aldana, he looked much much improved, and that was a fight where you know there was a huge huge amount of people betting on Aldana in that fight. Um, and Steropoli really showed up and looked um, vastly, vastly improved in that fight. Now, he didn't look too, you know, he didn't look that great. You know, he, he fought a lower-level opponent in Aldana, and he, he won the fight three rounds to zero. But, you know, he kind of just marched forward and threw, threw punches. You know, he was, you know, very active. He had good output, good cardio in that fight, threw, threw heavy punches, uh, you know, and a lot of punches for 15 minutes straight. His, his gas tank looked really good in that fight. His pressure looked good, but, you know, he just wasn't fighting a fighter with, you know, good power, with, you know, and who did really anything well. You know, Aldana is one of the lower level guys on the roster, and it showed in that fight. And, you know, even even in that, Steropoli was still getting caught with some punches. He was still eating a lot of leg kicks from Aldana. He wasn't checking leg kicks at all. And let me tell you something if you're not checking leg kicks against Tiago Alves, you're going to be in for a rough night. You know, Alves has a fucking cemetery of legs in his backyard you know this dude has been kicking people's legs off for 10 years in the ufc you know you know what's coming with alves he's got that muay thai style um where he's uh you know attacking the lead leg you know mostly boxing you know he doesn't really do too much muay thai anymore he was at one point a muay thai guy and you know he does throw a lot of leg kicks but that's that's really about all he does muay thai wise um 
you know, he, he definitely looks his age, you know, he's getting up there in age and experience, you know, almost 40 fights, and like I said, been fighting for 15 years uh, straight, you know, barely any breaks for Thiago Alves, but he's looked improved lately, uh, you know, he did go through a rough patch maybe two or three years ago, but in his most recent couple of fights, I think he's looked much improved. Uh, you know, versus Alexi Konchenko, I thought that, uh, I thought Alves won that fight, you know, I thought Alves won rounds one and two of that fight, and, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a robbery, because they were really close rounds, you know, Konchenko's home country of Russia, you know, it was real, no real surprise that he lost that decision, um, but still upsetting to see, none the least, I did think that Alves won that fight, I thought his leg kicks were on point in that fight, you know, he still got, you know, crisp uh, crisp hands he's got good technique in, in boxing you know max griffin was you know hitting him with some, some stiff punches in 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 their fight you know it looked like the first 30 seconds of the fight against max griffin max griffin hit alves with the combination and it looked like uh, it stunned alves now in the next three or four minutes of that fight alves fought back and made that a close round it was on his way to you know you know, it being a toss-up round, even though he got hurt early, but then in the last couple of seconds of that round one versus Max Griffin, he got dropped and uh, was almost, not I wouldn't say almost finished, but he was in a bad, bad spot in round one of that fight. But, uh, you know, Alves came back fighting. He came back and won round two. Uh, you know, had the had the body kick going. Actually, it looked like he hurt uh, Max Griffin with some, with some punches in that fight. Got Gr uh, Griffin and caught against the cage and definitely had Griffin, you know, on Queer Street for a little bit in that fight, but he, uh, you know, he started looking good in round three in that fight again, but, you know, it just looked like his cardio gave out on him. He he was, you know, he was he was done at that point in that fight. He got took, taken out a couple times and just grinded out for the last three minutes. He just couldn't get back up to his feet. He couldn't reverse the position, and he spent the last three minutes on his back, but he still won a split decision in that fight despite him pretty clearly losing rounds one and three of that fight. Uh, you know, he did have success in round two. He did look good. Uh, in round two, um, but he did lose that fight, so it's funny, uh, Alves' most recent fights against Kuchenko, I thought he won, and he lost that fight, and uh, against Griffin, I thought he lost, and he won that fight, so uh, the judges are, are disagreeing with Alves in that one, but that last fight was in Brazil, it was, and you know, Alves versus a non-Brazilian, and Alves got the decision in that one, so you gotta, you gotta take that into consideration for this matchup, but Getting down to how I think it's going to play out, man. I think that Alves will be at attacking that lead leg, man. Steripoli did not check many leg kicks at all. He was real heavy on that lead leg uh, versus uh, Aldana in his most recent fight. And he threw a lot of low success type of offense. You know, those flying knees, spinning back fists, spinning back kicks. You do that shit against Alves, man. He's going to be chopping down that lead leg all day. Um, you know, the, the spinning back kick is a perfect technique to counter with a leg kick. You know, right when you move at a distance of that spinning back kick, you know, you chop that leg while all that weight is, you know, s steady on that leg. So I think that Alves will be uh, will be chopping down that lead leg. I think it'll be contested, you know, mostly on, or 100% on the feet, honestly. I really can't see this one going to the ground. And I think that Alves has a good chance of winning this fight. You know, I think that Steripoli will have the better output, the better pressure, the better cardio. And, you know, he just might land the better boxing uh, shots of the fight just because he's going to be more active. But I think Alves will have the power advantage. He'll definitely have the advantage with the leg kicks. And I think that Alves has a good chance at hurting Steripoli because Steripoli does not think about defense much, man. He's almost completely offense. You know, that fight against Aldana, he was willing to tuck his chin and just get in wild exchanges very often in that fight. And if he does that against Alves here, I think that he has a good chance of getting his chin caught and he has a you know, good chance of getting knocked out. So I'm going to slightly lean with Alves. I think that uh, you know, the leg kicks will be a big factor in this fight. I think the power advantage for Alves will be big. I think the, the Brazilian judges will be, be a, you know, a, 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 an ace up Alves' sleeve, if you will. But I can see, you know, Steropoli being the more active, being the more pressure fighter and winning a decision that way. But it's going to be tough, man. You're going to have to beat Alves handedly um, to get that decision in Brazil. So I'm going to side with Alves in this one. And I'm going to actually pick him, pick him to get it done by knockout. 
The next fight is taking place in the featherweight division. We have Jose Aldo, who is 28 and 4, taking on Alexander Volkanovski, who is 19 and 1. The opening betting line for this one was Aldo at minus 185 to Volkanovski at plus 145. Right now, over on Five Dimes, we are seeing Aldo minus 135 to Volkanovski at plus 155. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a phenomenal fight. I think we got some good fights in the main. Uh, the the this whole card. You no, know, the main event is going to be terrific. It's a great matchup. But none of the fights are better than this one. We got one of the best fighters of all time, Jose Aldo. Easily, you know, I'd say the best uh, uh, of the generation. You know, and I don't know. I don't know what I'm classifying that as. You know, uh, he just looks. He just looks so you know crisp lately in his last couple of fights, man. You know, you don't have to. We don't have to go through Aldo's resume too much. You know, it speaks for itself. A legend of the sport. Um, you know, and Volkanovski, man, is is a motherfucker, man. This dude has been sw- storming through the UFC lately. He's six and zero in the UFC. He's you know got three knockouts, three you know absolute beatings he put on people. You know, faced some real stiff competition. Hirota, Shane Young, Jeremy Kennedy, beating Darren Elkins, and of course his most impressive victory, getting uh, that knockout over Chad Mendez in his most recent fight, man. Volkanovski's got good boxing he's got some power he's got real good wrestling ground and pound top control but i'll just go out and say it man i i favor aldo in this matchup man jose aldo has fought dudes like volkanovsky throughout his career man he fought mendez twice he fought um uh edgar twice edgar and all or edgar and mendez are two, two of the best featherweights of all time guess what aldo's record against them is it's four and oh man some of the best wrestler wrestle boxers pressure fighters to ever fight uh fight in the featherweight division and aldo beat them you know handedly so you know aldo's takedown defense man is just you know impeccable some of the best takedown defense in ufc history you know he he stuffs takedowns you know pretty much better than many better than any fighter i've ever really seen uh, you know, he's got incredible leg kicks, he's got good good boxing, good head movement, just incredible eyes, his IQ is, you know, just unmatched, he see he sees punches coming so well, I think he's, you know, even, even, uh, even though he's on the, the outs of his career, even though he's getting up there in age and experience, I think he's got some of the best head movement in the UFC, and he's been, you know, his last two most recent fights, man, we've been seeing a different Jose Aldo, you know, Aldo was known as, you know, uh, from, the time he got in the UFC in 2011 to 2015, you know, I'd say, he was known as like a five-round fight type of guy where he'd kick your legs off and just beat you down for tw- uh, four or five rounds. But, you know, his past most couple recent fights, man, have, you know, he's been getting the finish, man. I don't think he's, he hasn't seen the, the decision in five, right, five fights, uh, no, not five fights in a row. Uh, Edgar, he beat Edgar by decision. So he got finished by... Um, Holloway back to back. Then he picked up back to back finishes in his most recent fights over extremely good competition, finishing Jeremy Stevens with that liver shot, and then uh, finishing Moise Cano with that left hook and that barrage of punches in his home country, Brazil, just a few months ago. Um, so, you know, in terms of, uh, let's see how this fight is going to play out, man. Uh, you know, Volkanovski is going to be pressuring Aldo. I think that um, he's going to be looking to get Aldo's back against the cage. He's going to be looking to establish his jab. He might even look to go for a takedown, but I think that Aldo's takedown defense will hold. I think that um, Vol- Aldo will, will keep the fight standing. Uh, I think that he will be kicking Volkanovski's legs. I think Mendez had some success kicking uh, Volkanovski's legs in their fight. Um, you know, Mendez t- uh, took down Volkanovski a couple of times. Um, you know, and Mendez, you know, Mendez hurt Volkanovski with some punches. He dropped Volkanovski with the, with a, uh, a two punch combination in round two of that fight. Now. Volkanovski did v- recover very well. He bounced right back up to his feet, and then he actually finished, uh, v- you know, Mendez himself. You know, just a, a minute later in that fight. But uh, Volkanovski de- definitely showed some weakness in that fight. You know, he he got dropped by Mendez, the guy who retired after that fight. Who you know kind of came in. He he came back from that USADA suspension already a foot after uh, a foot out the door. You know, I think he wanted to. 
one more pay, one more paycheck and you know test himself one more time. He fought Miles Jury and he won by knockout. And he said, "Shit, that was easy. Let me go back and try one more time." And they gave him Volkanovski, and unfortunately, he ran into a brick wall with Volkanovski. But even in that fight, even with Mendez having one fight out the door, even though Mendez's cardio did not look too good, he looked he looked scared in that fight. You know, he he looked like he didn't want to be in there that much. Mendez still had a lot of success against Volkanovski, so. I think the I think the Aldo will be kicking Volkanovski's leg in this one. I think that uh, he will be avoiding the, the the power punches of Volkanovski, and I think he will be countering Volkanovski with some power punches of his own. You know, we just seen Aldo fight so much more aggressively and throw with so much more power in his most recent fights, man. I think that this one is not going to the scorecards. I think that. You know, Volkanovski definitely has a chance to win this fight, man. You know, Aldo's uh, chin is, you know, definitely in question. You know, he it looked like he got rocked versus uh, uh, Jeremy Stevens for a short amount of time. Now, if you go watch that exchange, it really looked like Aldo kind of just tripped up over his own feet. It looked like he didn't have his feet about him. Now, with now, not not saying that he didn't, you know, he wasn't in any trouble in that fight. You still don't want to be messing up your footwork too much against Volkanovski. You know, he still slipped up in that fight, and that could lead him to getting, you know, finished in this fight. But I don't think Volkanovski will will have the the, the the boxing to get it done. I don't think he'll have the takedowns to you know get uh, Aldo down. I don't think he'll be able to get that type of fight where he usually likes, where he takes a guy down against the cage. He keeps you against the cage. He you know, uses that heavy top control and smashes you the ground a pound. Aldo's uh, takedown defenses against the cage is you know just incredible, uh, and. You know, at distance too, Aldo can stuff a takedown. He can scramble. He's got incre just incredible wrestling. So I think that uh, Aldo will be hitting that leg kick. I think that he will be, you know, uh, avoiding the punches of, of Volkanovski. I think that he will be landing the cleaner, harder shots. And I think that that uh, the, uh, Aldo's damage will be accumulating after a while. I think this will be a high pace type of fight and i think that aldo does get the finish somewhere in this fight i actually lean the, for it to be in the later rounds probably in rounds three uh and unlike uh aldo's most recent finish in round one and rounds two of his most recent fights um you know i'm just really looking forward to this fight it's going to be a crazy crazy fucking fight um even though i do fa uh side with aldo in this one i think that i'm not going to be betting on his money line i just think that there's you know i have too much emotionally invested in this fight to uh you know be betting too much on the money line i did hit the fight does not go the distance at plus money while i was at it and a little bit on all those tko lines so hoping for a great fight in this one and hoping uh one of my favorite fighters ever one of the greatest fighters ever jose aldo gets another win in this one now the next fight we are moving up to the co-main event of the evening in the Middleweight division, we have Jared Cannonier, who is 11 and 4, taking on Anderson Silva, who is 34 and 9. The opening betting line for this one was Cannonier minus 240 to Silva at plus 190. Right now, we are seeing Cannonier minus 135 to Silva at plus 115. So, a lot more action coming in on Anderson Silva's way. And I agree, where that initial line movement was set was crazy. Anderson Silva has a you know a two to one underdog against Cannoneer in Brazil. You know, uh, uh, congratulations to all who got uh, Silva at that price. Now, Jared Cannoneer, it was a former heavyweight. You know, has made his way down a lightweight or light heavyweight. wasn't having too much success, and was and then eventually moved his way down to middleweight where he made his debut last fight against David Branch and you know he he faced some some good uh, some early adversity in that fight he was taken down a few times by Branch but he had some good get up skills man you know he did not accept bottom position he got right back up to his feet almost all three times he got taken down uh, by Branch in that fight you know and Canadier was like a 4 to 1 underdog in that fight uh, after round one, and you know, Branch was gassed, man. He was so tired. He went for one takedown. He got stuffed in round two, and then Cannonier floored him with the right hand, dropped Branch with a you know a nice uh, nice punch, and then eventually finished Branch with some ground and pound later in that fight. You know, very impressive uh, debut at 185 from Cannonier, but you know, it's it's I feel like that that perf that 
that moment might be a bit of an anomaly. You know, we've we've never really seen Cannoneer have too crisp striking before. You know, I'd say his striking was his best aspect, but it was not. You know, it was not a very good tool of him. You know, he was you know outstruck by uh, Jan Blahovic to a decision. Uh, he was, you know, knocked out by Dominic Reyes. You know, the only guys he has beaten, you know, were lower-level guys. Cyro Cyr- Asker, Ian Kutaleba, Nick Rorick. You know, uh, Dave Brandt, who was definitely his first big win of his career. And then all of a sudden, he's fighting Anderson Silva, one of the best fighters ever. And he's a minus 240 favorite. So that's pretty crazy. I think where the line movement is set now is much more accurate. And, you know, have not really seen too much, uh, you know, offensive wrestling from Cannoneer. I don't think that he'll look to take this fight to the floor with Silva, where Silva has had a little bit of trouble versus uh, Derek Brunson a couple years ago. Silva was taken down in that fight, and he lost uh, rounds one and three of that fight versus Brunson. Somehow got gifted a decision in Brooklyn in that one. Um, I, you know, that's just... That just goes to show that Anderson Silva, you know, he, there's a, a mystique about him. The fact that he lost rounds one and three versus Derek Brunson and still was gi- uh, gi- given a decision. He was given a 30-27 decision by one judge in that fight. Just uh, There's no way in hell that the, the judges weren't influenced by the fact that it was Anderson Silva in there. He's one of the most notorious fighters of all time, and that's how he won that decision. But I don't think Cannonier will try to wrestle in this one. I think this one will be contested mostly on the feet, where even though Anderson Silva is 44 motherfucking years old, he is still sharp, man. You saw that in the fight against Israel Adesanya. He still can compete with the best of the best. He, you know, was counterboxing in that fight. He landed a couple uh, nice counter right hooks in that fight. He, you know, still has great eyes, great instincts. He can, he can be a little tentative and low output, and. You know, he hasn't really shown up with much uh, tenacity or much aggressiveness in his most, you know, recent couple of fights. He will definitely have to be more active in this fight. And uh, as long as he is active, I I think that he will win a decision in this one. Or he could possibly even knock Kennedy out if he really sits down on a shot. But I don't think he'll knock him out. I, I, you know, Silva doesn't really throw with much power anymore. He's more of a, a volume type of guy. So I think that... As long, like I said, as long as Silva is throwing punches, as long as he is, you know, throwing kicks, he's active in this fight. I think that he should outstrike Cannoneer quite easily. You know, Cannoneer, as you know, although he did drop the branch of that that punch, he looks like he has some good power on the feet. He just he doesn't have much technique. He doesn't have, you know, I don't think he has the finesse to touch the chin of Anderson Silva, one of the greatest fighters ever. I think that Cannoneer will have a big strength advantage, and if he looks to you know push Silva up against the cage and maybe look for a takedown or maybe look to just grind him out with his strength, that's his best path, best path to victory in this fight. But if Cannoneer stays at range with Silva and tries to out kickbox him, man, I see him losing this fight, especially in his hometown or his home country of Brazil. You know we have not seen Anderson Silva fight in Brazil since. Uh, you know, UFC 152 or something like that versus Stefan Bonner way back in 2012 or any, yeah, 2012. So it's going to be a special moment to see Anderson Silva get back in the cage in Brazil. I think that that place will be going absolutely fucking bonkers for, uh, for Anderson Silva. Every leg kick, every feint he lands, will the crowd will be cheering. And I think that he will win a decision uh, versus Cannonier in this fight. Now the next fight in the main event of the evening in the women's strawweight division for the title we have champion Rose Namajunas who is 8 and 3 taking on Jessica Andrade who is 19 and 6. The opening betting line for this one was Jessica Andrade the minus 120 favorite to Rose Namajunas as the plus 100 underdog. Right now we are seeing over on 5 dimes Andrade is minus 125 to Nami Yunus at plus 105. So line margins have uh, stayed about the same. You know, there's definitely two-way action coming in, coming in on this fight. 
And man, what a close matchup we have in this one. You know, this is, you know, absolutely high level women's mixed martial arts. You know, possibly one of the highest level matchups uh, ever in, in women's MMA. So it's going to be a real treat to, to watch this one. You know, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to seeing how it plays out. And I'm honestly not confident in either side. I will come out and say that right away. You know, it seems like a lot of people in this one are confident in Andrade. I don't really think you can be. I don't think you can be confident in either side. I think it's just such a close matchup. And, you know, both of these women have, you know, clear strengths and clear weaknesses. And, uh, you know, I'll try to do my best best to break down, you know, uh, the weakness, their strengths and weaknesses and see who I give the edge to. So let's start things off with the challenger, Jessica Andrade. Um, you know, since dropping down to uh, straw weight, she was a former bantamweight. weight. She's 6 and 1. Uh, the only loss coming to um, Joanna Yen Jacek. Now, Rose Nam Yunus is 6 and 1 in her past 7. Only loss coming to Karolina Kovalkiewicz. Now, uh, Nam Yunus lost to Kovalkiewicz. And um, Andrade lost to Yen Jacek. You know, so both of these women are, you know, they, they uh, have have beaten the fighter who the mo the fighter has lost to most recently, if that makes sense. Now, uh, Andrade, her she she lacks technical skill. I'll go out and say it. Her technique is not very good, but she's so aggressive, so powerful, and so strong that she is still out here winning fights decisively against great competition. You know, uh, against Claudia Gedalia, you know, look at her most, three most recent fights. You know, three of some of the best women, you know, the best perennial contenders in, in the women's division. Claudia Gedalia, Tisha Torres, and Carolina Kovacavich. Um, You know, Gedalia, she won that fight uh, decisively, man. She was taking down Gedalia. She was smashing Gedalia with ground and pound. Gedalia, you know, a world-class grappler, couldn't do anything off her back. She was just, you know... Uh, Andrade was just sitting in half guard or sitting in her guard and just smashing Gedalia with ground and pound. Um, you know, she was also trading some wild exchanges with Gedalia on the feet in that one. You know, she's she's so willing to just tuck her chin and throw punches. She's confident in her chin. She's confident in her power. And, you know, it, it shows very evidently when she's fighting. Uh, you know, Jessica Andrade, her, one of her problems is she just doesn't close distance well. You know, her the way she closes distance is just by marching forward and by you know sprinting forward she doesn't really cut off the cage at all she just chases her opponents down and just walks through any attack until she gets to her opponents it doesn't matter if they're punches or leg kicks she'll just keep marching forward Karolina Kovalkiewicz in her most recent fight uh, was actually tagging Andrade with some punches while you know that fight started off a brawl. Andrade started marching forward, throwing bombs from the first, you know, 10 seconds of that fight. But Carolina was was throwing back heavy shots, and she was landing clean on Andrade's chin. Now, Andrade just had so much more power and so much more, you know, aggressiveness that she was just marching through it as always. But that's not a sustainable strategy. You know, if she, if you... If she can't, or she didn't knock out Kovalkiewicz, you know, uh, two minutes into that fight, who knows what would, would have happened? You know, she can't march forward and eat shots for the entirety of the fight. You know, that's what happened versus Gedalia. Uh, uh, Andrade came into that fight and, you know, was just staying at range and was not able to close the distance. And uh, Jacek was kicking Andrade's legs nonstop. You know, uh, Andrade was not checking leg kicks one bit. Yeah, Jacek landed 65 leg kicks in that fight, uh, you know, but it, it didn't seem to phase Andrade. She kept marching forward from bell to bell 25 minutes, even though she was getting outstruck clean the entire fight. Even though her takedowns weren't working, she was still marching forward for 25 minutes. It's like she's just a, a fucking juggernaut, man. It's like it's like she, nothing phases her. I've, I've never seen Andrade hurt, you know. She, she just is an absolute animal. And... You know, in, in her fight with Tisha Torres, Andrade struggled in the first round of that fight. You know, she was trying to close that distance and, you know, march forward with big heavy punches. But Tisha Torres was moving backwards and was landing the, the, the more cleaner, harder punches. You know, Andrade wasn't able to close that distance. And T Torres, you know, was, was making her pay for it, was making her pay for marching forward with her hands down and her chin up. So Torres did win the first round of that fight, but... 
Andrade made a great adjustment in between rounds one and round two of that fight. She decided to, she got a takedown at the end of round one, and she said, you know what, I'm going to grapple for the rest of this fight. And she was able to take Torres down and win the rest of the fight on the ground for the most part. Now, Torres never stopped fighting in that fight. She was popping back up to her feet. She was, you know, uh, she was stuffing takedowns. She was, you know, not giving up to the last moment, throwing up subs from her back at, at all times. But, you know, when uh, when it all uh, came said and done, you know, Andrade still did the better work in that fight. She kept Torres on her back for the la or the most of the, the latter rounds of that fight. And uh, Andrade won that fight, uh, you know, pretty decisively at the end of it. So, you know, Andrade is, you know, she's a beast, man. She, she, you know, she does get hit too much on the feet, though. And, and that's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to be something to look out for in this fight because, you know, she can't eat punches the entire time. You know, her after a while, you know, that chin is going to give out on her. And, you know, people people mistakenly think that Nami Yunus doesn't have power, man. They must have forgot what she did to Ioana Jacek back at Madison Square Garden, man. She dropped yeah, J Jack with with a left hook in that fight floored yeah J Jack. You know uh, all all the spotlight uh, in the power scheme of things is going towards Andrade in this fight because she scored that that one punch knockout over uh, uh, Carolina in her last fight. But don't don't forget that that Rose Namunis has serious power in her hands, man. Rose Namunis' boxing has been so improved lately. You know, she she you know showed up to that fight uh, against Yajajek in the first fight was you know out striking her in the beginning, eventually dropped and, and finished her in that fight, and in the second fight as well, the rematch, the fight the fight that won five rounds. Namunis started off that fight strong. Once one rounds one and two versus Joanna was landing the better, cleaner punches. She has real good long punches. You know she understands her 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 length and her her reach very well. But you know she struggled in rounds three and four versus Yajajic. Looks like she kind of took those rounds off. She was she was moving backwards a lot. The leg kick started to 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 accumulate on her. And she was not as effective moving backwards versus Yed Jacek in that fight. Now, Nam Yunus did dig deep, come back, and wins win round five of that fight um, to, to retain her belt. But, you know, those rounds three and four are very worrisome because she's going to be having to fight backwards in this fight against Andrade. You know, there's Andrade never stops moving forward. You know, she never takes one step backwards. So, Nami Yunus is going to have to fight effectively moving backwards to win this fight. And I have no doubt that she will not be able to do so as well as Ioana Yajajek did versus Andrade. You know, Ioana Yajajek pretty much pitched a perfect game and a no hitter versus Andrade, you know, she did get taken down once or twice, but she popped back up to her feet the entire time, and she was moving backwards, avoiding all the attacks of Andrade, avoiding that big power shot of Andrade, and was just able to cleanly outstrike Andrade for 25 minutes, you know, just want a pitcher perfect performance from Joanna get Jacek in that fight, and I just don't think that Joanna had, or excuse me, that Nami Yunus has that same striking ability to implicate that same perfect game plan. I think this fight's going to be a lot closer. It's going to be a lot uglier. No, I do think that Nami Yunus can outstrike Andrade for a, you know a five round decision. I think that um, you know it's it, it's possible, but man, it's gonna be it's gonna be ugly. She's gonna have to dig deep. You know, she's gonna take a, a, a big amount of damage herself. And uh, you know, I really hope that Nami Yunus is is well prepared for this fight because it takes a very specific and well executed game plan to beat Jessica Andrade, and that's why only one woman has been able to do it in the past three or four years. Years, especially at at straw weight you know the only fighter who has been able to do it was you know the best striker uh in in women's strike women's mma history now nami Yunus did beat that best striker in in wmma history twice now so it's not impossible that nami Yunus can pull pull off this win and you know in terms of the ground game in this one it's going to be tough it's going to be close man nami Yunus has a great ground game she's got um, great submissions, you know, that's definitely her bread and butter. You don't, you don't really know her too much for stuff and takedowns, you know, um, but you know, that's going to be, it's going to be really interesting to see, to see that where the grappling goes in this one, because when Andrade goes for takedowns, man, she, she uses brute strength. She doesn't use technique. She doesn't shoot clean takedowns. She just grabs a hold of you and uses muscle to get you down. 
and that is not very you know that very technical at all you know nami Yunus can certainly maybe uh take advantage of that that wild uh powerful takedown of andraj and possibly snatch up a submission and transition versus andraj you know how fucking crazy would that be but don't don't forget man nami Yunus came into the ufc tapping everybody out she came in tapping everybody out, you know, flying arm bars and, you know, everything like that. And then all of a sudden, she her boxing got better. Her kicks got better. You know, she rocked Michelle Waterson with that kick. Um, you know, she's just, Manam Yudis has been making huge improvements in her in her fights lately. She is the champion. She's defending her belt. She's going down to Brazil. She's got fucking balls going down to Brazil. Andrade's home country and you know uh trying to defend her belt against a brazilian of an extremely dangerous one at that you know if you hear any anybody anybody i don't care how good of a capper they are at mma how well they know mma bringing up rose nami Yunus's mental state in this fight you know using that as a as a legit uh you know reason why she's gonna lose man disqualify that person from from you know contention you know they Rose Namunis, you know, she did, uh, she w apparently did suffer some, some problems, you know, from the emotionally after Conor McGregor threw that dolly through her bus, but she, she defeated Ioana Jacek in a five round kickboxing fight the day after that happened, you know, so it's not like, it's not like that really is going to affect her performance. Um, she did have a long layoff since that fight, you know, it's a 13 month layoff, but she's been facing injuries as well. It's not because of her fucking mental state. So that's a complete non-factor for me. Nami Yus is going to be game in there. And when it comes down to which fighter I think will be more prepared for the matchup, I think it's going to be Nami Yunus. I think that she, you know, Trevor Whitman, one of the best coaches in the game, and, you know, just how well she's improved in her most recent fight. She's got great training partners like Valentina Shevchenko to be training with. Uh, I think I think she might train with Macy Barber, too, out in Colorado. I could be wrong. Um, but... You know, she's, she's just going to have, uh, you know, she's going to be well, well prepared for this fight. On the other hand, Andrade, you know, I, I don't really trust that she'll come fully prepared. She might come in the same fighter that she always is, that, that you know, female Vanderlei Silva where she marches forward and throws hooks and, you know, doesn't doesn't really fight too technically. So I, I, I'm going to side with the champion, Nami Yunus. I think that her fight IQ is better. I think that she can, uh, you know, she will be better prepared for this fight. I think her cardio, her conditioning will be good. I think that her movement will be improved. I think that she, we're going to see her fighting backwards very well. And even though she did, uh, you know, she did kind of have trouble with the pressure of uh, Karolina Kovacavich when they fought. You know, she had trouble with the clinch. She got, you know, hit with some clean punches in the clinch versus Karolina. Got hit with some clean punches in the clinch versus Tisha Torres, you know, a like it looked like she got rocked a couple times or uh, uh, in her career versus Carolina and versus Tisha. I just think that she's going to come in here, you know, putting the best performance of her life against Andrade. It's going to be technical. She's going to have to fight perfect in this one, but I think that she can do it. I also think that Andrade can win this fight, man. I think that the power will be, uh, the power and the pressure is going to be hard to deal with for Nami Yunus in this one. I think that, uh, you know, Andrade has a good chance at catching the chin of Nami Yunus, you know, rocking her with a shot and finishing her. I, I can see Andrade just pressuring and landing the cleaner, harder strikes for a five round decision in this one. You know, there's a lot of different ways this fight can play out, man. It's truly, truly, uh, you know, a 50 50 type of fight, in my opinion. It's, you know, a, the highest level matchup MMA has to offer, not women's MMA, MMA, you know, the, if you hear anybody complaining about uh, this main event, man, th there has to be, you know, some misogyny going on with there, you know, that someone doesn't like the fact that there are two, you know, well-rounded, incredibly skilled uh, women's fighters in the world, and they have a problem with that, so if you hear anybody complaining about this fight, man, they're not a real fight fan, these, th this will be a, this will be a hell of a fucking fight, man, I can't wait for it, and I'm gonna side with the champion, Nami Yudas, to get it done by decision. And that will do the pay-per-view analysis for this car. The UFC 237 pay-per-view goes down this Saturday, May 11th, at starting at 6:30 p.m. The main card starts at 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the I believe the uh, the prelims will be on ESPN Plus. The prelim or the early prelims are ESPN Plus. 
the uh, regular prelims on ESPN and of course the main card on ESPN plus as well now with that being said we're just going to quickly recap the UFC Ottawa card that went down this past weekend just going to breeze through the results like we've been doing lately um, Cole Smith came out here and won a decision against Mitch Gagnon. Pretty fun back and forth fight in that one, honestly. Uh, but Cole Smith came uh, looking looking pretty good in that one for his debut. Uh, Arjun Bueller defeated Juan Adams in that fight. Pretty close decision, honestly. I thought Adams might have edged it, but you know Bueller did. Close fight. Uh, Matt Sales, Kyle Nelson, another back and forth fight, man. You know Sales won round one. Almost had Nelson finish. Nelson came back one round two. Almost gave uh, almost finished sales. It, they had it was back to back. Ten, they traded ten eight rounds, and then in the third round, sales was the fresher fighter, and he got the uh, arm triangle choke. Really good fight in that one. Nordin Taleb, you know, had a really low intensity low, uh, kickboxing match with Kyle Prep. Like won that one uh, comfortably. Vince Morales beat Alan uh, Alaman Zahabi via decision, two rounds to one. I don't even remember that fight. Macy Chaston uh, faced some early adversity, got taken down by Sarah Morris and spent her whole first round on the back, but then came back in round two and TKO'd uh, Morris in that one. Andrew Sanchez, Mark Andre Bayou, really competitive fight, man. Sanchez won round one. Bayou came back and almost finished Sanchez in round two, and then Sanchez came back round three and secured the two rounds to one victory. Walt Harris ran through uh, Sergey Spivyak in this one, finished him 50 seconds into that fight. Merab Devashvili, uh, you know, put on a masterclass performance versus Brad Katona, took him down relentlessly in that one, uh, and won that one three rounds to zero. Shane Burgos, uh, you know, very impressive performance, outstriking Cub Swanson in that one, winning a split, a controversial split decision. You know, that should have been unanimous all day. Um, so, you know, uh, but Swanson was game in that one. You know, he looked he looked very decent in that fight. Cub is nowhere near a shot fighter, um, despite losing four in a row now. Derek Brunson defeated uh, Elias Theodoro. Very uh, low intensity uh, fight in that one. Low output from both of them. And in the main event, uh, one of the best fighters in UFC history, Donald Cowboy Cerrone, picked up another victory versus Ally Quinza and another you know classic performance. One of it, one of his most sharpest, most complete performances as a fighter, and which is just crazy to say about Cowboy. He's just so fucking good, man. He dropped one, round ones to. Uh, I thought he lost rounds one and two to Ally Quinza. But then in rounds three, he started dialing in, man. He he started he couldn't miss rounds three, four, and five. He dropped I Quince at the end of round three. He dropped him in round four, and he beat him decisively in round five. You know, uh, I think the judges gave him four rounds to one. I thought it was 3-2, honestly. I was live betting shit at Cerrone in this one. Live betting fight goes the distance. You know, it was a, you know, you know Cerrone is just, you know, incredible, man. Can't say enough great things about him. I love the dude to death. And he made me some good cash that night on the live betting side of things. So um, with that being said, we just recap the UFC auto card. We preview the entire 13 fight UFC 237 card. And that will do it for episode 60 of the Martian MMA podcast. Uh, I want to thank uh, MMAPodcast.com, BestFightOds.com, MMADecisions.com, FiveDimes.eu, BestDSI.eu, and NewsomeMMA.com, all the in, all the uh, resources, uh, and Topology.com, another one too. All the resources that make this podcast happen, you know, not sponsored or affiliated with any of them besides Five Dimes, you know that. Um, but, you know, I appreciate all those resources and they help me make the podcast every week. So, hope everybody enjoys the car from Brazil this weekend and I will catch you guys before next week's card. Peace.